Howdy and welcome to the 10-Week Bible Study. This is week six, day three of our study of Galatians and Colossians. I'm your host, Darren Hibbs, and today we're talking about Galatians 6, 11 through 18. Welcome back to the 10 Week Bible Study. Again, I'm your host, Darren Hibbs. Would you join me as we pray before we start? Jesus, touch our hearts and fill us with the knowledge of you from your word today. We want to know you more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. With that, let's jump into God's word. We'll be reading today from the NIV. This is Galatians 6, starting in verse 11. See what large letters I use to, uh, as I write to you with my own hand. That's... <clears throat> this is a complete departure from everything he said already and what he's about to say. This is Paul just actually writing this letter with his own hand. Uh, as he got older, he had other people write his letters for him. Maybe this is the last letter he wrote by himself, or maybe this is, you know, he just didn't have Tertullus or the other guys that transcribes his letters for him. And so he's actually having to write. And you have to imagine, you have to picture in your mind, you know, Right now, I'm in a, a room with tons of cheap, bright LED lights that are lighting, and I've got some studio lighting in here as well, lighting me up. Uh, your house, everywhere you go, your offices, there's lights everywhere, right? In Paul's day, he's writing at night by candlelight, I mean, literally by candlelight. And so, you know, we know that what that did to people's eyes for ages. I mean, you've got uh, serious degeneration from being out in the sun all day with no sunglasses and then having to like try and squint and see what you're, you're writing by candlelight in the dark. I mean, this is a completely different world from the one that we live in. And unless you've traveled overseas, you've gone, you know, camping and, and you've not taken your giant you know, LED lanterns and things like that, or if you remember what it was like to go camping and, and even like the camping lanterns that I remember using as a kid is so much brighter than, you know, someone having to write by candlelight in the evening. And so Paul is sitting here struggling to write these things. And so he's writing really large because he can't see, he literally can't see. And so that's why his writing is so big. And that's what he's commenting on here. But he's telling him, I'm the one writing this. This isn't even by one of my guys that's you know scribing for me. This is actually me writing this to you. I love the, the personal touch that Paul adds there. All right, verse 12. Those who want to impress people by means of the flesh are trying to compel you to be circumcised. And there we have it right there. This is what it all comes down to. Paul saying it very clearly right here at the end. They're trying to get you to be circumcised, right? Paul is going to summarize almost this entire book in this next passage. And this is what it comes down to. They want you to be circumcised. They want you to follow Jewish laws and customs, and they can't do that themselves. Continuing on, the only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised keep the law, yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your circumcision in the flesh. Here's the problem. You've got the, the Jewish Christians, they have become Christians, and the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law, everyone else, the priests, the Levites, who are still kind of in this Jewish system, they control a lot of the Jewish society. And so if you're a Jew who's converted to Christianity, in many cases, and we saw this very clearly, we saw this very clearly in the book of John, when Jesus heals a, a man born blind, <clears throat> and then he's, you know, his 30s or whatever it was, <clears throat> and the, the Sanhedrin or the Pharisees, uh, whichever the case it was, I think it was the Sanhedrin in this case, they call him before them and they question the, the man, like, you know, what happened? And he's like, hey, Jesus healed me. And they're not satisfied with this answer. And so they actually haul his family, his parents in front of them. And this is an intimidation tactic, right? They're hauling his parents in front of them to say, I mean, he's like in his 30s and they haul them in front of them to say, hey, what happened to your son? And, and John specifically says, because they were afraid of getting kicked out of the synagogue, right? They were going to get kicked out of Jewish society, which would have made buying and selling at the market and just so many other things. Maybe they were business people, whatever they had going is going to make it very difficult for them to exist in the Jewish society. And so they're like, Oh, you know, he's of age. Like you can't ask us. You got to ask him. 
You know, they, they, they passed the buck. They didn't want to say, we know that he was healed by Jesus. They're afraid of getting removed from this society. And this is the very real pressure that's going on for all of these Jewish Christians. And so there are these Jewish Christians that are kind of on what I would consider the margin, right? Maybe they've professed Jesus, but they are very easily persuaded to kind of fall back away or to give back into saying, yes, Jesus saves us, but really and truly, he doesn't save us unless we're Jewish first. Unless you do these things first, or, you know, they're getting sucked back into this because of pressure. And so Paul's saying they, they're doing this because they don't want to face the persecution that we do. Right. He's like, <clears throat> I've been kicked out of the, the Pharisee club. Paul's been kicked out of really the, uh, for the most part, the, the Jewish club. They don't really, I mean, he's still Jewish and he claims it, but they don't really want him around and they're persecuting him. And so he's saying they're taking the easy road here. And they actually want to boast about you. They want to say, hey, I got these converts back to, you know, Judaism or whatever it is. He's like, that, that's what they're trying to do because it's, it's, it's an overcompensation. They can't obey the law. They know they can't obey the law. They pretend like they can, but they can't. And so it's like the more people you surround yourself with that are just as bad as you, the better you feel about yourself. Now, it doesn't make you actually feel better, but it when you think, hey, I'm just as bad as everyone else around me, by comparison, you convince yourself. Now, again, it doesn't actually work. You don't actually feel better. You just tell yourself that you do. And then you go on in the misery of, of comparison and all that. Verse 14, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So Paul's saying, I don't want to boast about anything. He's, <laughs> I mean, he kind of boast about a few other things here and there, but really in truly what he's saying is I don't want to, I don't want anything in my life. I don't want to brag or boast about anything unless it's about Jesus or what Jesus has done through me or what Jesus has done to me or anything like that. So that's the only thing that I want to brag about is Jesus. And he's saying the world is dead to me. Like I've been crucified to the world and, and the world to me, I'm dead to the world. Like they don't want me. And the world is dead to me. I don't need it either. Right? That's that's his mentality now is he doesn't need the coercion or he doesn't need to feel the approval of being in that Jewish society anymore. And that's where he stands. Verse 15. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is the new creation. Let's pause right there. What he's saying is, whether you're circumcised or not, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you've given your life to Jesus. That's the new creation that you have been, you have experienced life afresh, life anew, that you have given your life to Jesus. He has ransomed you and turned you into this new creation. That's the thing that matters. Verse 16, peace and mercy to all who follow this rule to the Israel of God. Now, Paul is saying right here, he is calling everyone in the church, everyone, every Christian, everyone who calls in the name of Jesus. What he's saying is he's saying you are the Israel of God. And there are people that will uh, spouse what's called replacement theology. And they will use this as a, a passage to do that. <clears throat> this is not Paul saying you are now Israel and Israel is not Israel. That's not what he's saying. He's saying like in every place where Paul's talking about this, we have been adopted in, we've been grafted in all the places where Paul talks about Gentiles now getting counted as Abraham's seed, as the, the, the family of Abraham, the family of God, the Israel of God, like he says here. It's not that we have replaced Israel. It's that we are now part of Israel. We are now part and parcel to those promises that God gave to Israel, to his people. But we are not replacing Israel. He does not say that here. He does not say that anywhere. The Bible never, ever says that. And that is super important. We cannot read into the Bible things like replacement theology, where we say, well, we actually are Israel now. And all of the promises to Israel have passed away, and now they, they belong to the church. The Bible never says that. Paul never says that. We cannot construe this to say that Paul is saying that because he doesn't. He doesn't. He absolutely doesn't say that. 
All he's saying is that we get to be counted in on that now. It's not that we've replaced them. We get to be part of it. Verse 17. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. Paul isn't saying anything mystical here. He's not saying that, you know, he's somehow, you know, there's all these mystical things where people, you know, will have, say they have blood coming from their their hands or whatever, and they're bearing the marks of Jesus and, and all that kind of stuff. There's, there's, I mean, if you were to look it up, you'll find all sorts of things throughout the centuries. That's not what Paul's saying. Paul's been uh, beaten. He's, you know, he's uh, been stoned. <clears throat> uh, he even talks in other letters about how he's uh, more than likely what he's describing is he's been whipped by the cat of nine tails like Jesus was. So he's had like his flesh ripped off him. I mean, he is, he's scarred. He literally has scars all over his body. And so when he's saying he bears the marks of Jesus, he's talking about he has got scars like Jesus body has scars from all of the beatings that he took before the cross. The one thing that that I find interesting about this, because historically this isn't scriptural, but uh, historically and traditionally, people believe that eventually Paul was uh, killed. He was put to death, martyred in Rome alongside Peter uh, when all of the Christians in Rome were crucified by Emperor Nero. And so Paul would eventually, literally in every way, more than just the scars from the beatings, he would be crucified and hung on a cross. And so he would bear those, tr truly bear those marks. And so it'd be interesting to know as Paul, just speaking about the, the, the physical manifestations, the scars that he already has as he's writing this, or is he actually even prophesying that he knows how he's going to die? I don't know the answer to that. I don't think anybody does. I just think it's kind of interesting to think about since he does mention that here. I think I think more than likely what he's saying is that he bears those scars from his beatings in the past. So he's like, don't cause me, don't cause me any trouble. It's like, I, I've, I've been beaten for Jesus. Again, he's not saying anything mystical. And again, lots of people make all of these mystical things about how, you know, he's having all, all of these different manifestations, whatever it's, he's talking about. He's, he's been beaten and he has scars. Verse 18, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen. This is probably the shortest salutation of all of his letters. Most of Paul's letters, he's still not trying to make his point the sentence before he closes out. Most of the time, the whole last, what we always have taken as the last chapter of every one of Paul's epistles, uh, it's him greeting people and, and giving messages and personal things. And this is literally just, again, don't get circumcised. You don't need to. It's ridiculous. Don't fall into that trap. Uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen. Right. And then he's out. <clears throat> shortest, shortest ending as far as I know of any of Paul's letters. And with that, we've come to the end of Galatians. And I pray that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Now we're not done with this 10 week Bible study. We still have four weeks to go, but we're done with Galatians. And so this week we're cutting it just a little bit short and we'll be back next week, starting uh, with Colossians chapter one. So for the 10 week Bible study, I'm your host, Darren Hibbs, and I can't wait to see you next time. Hey, thanks for watching the 10 week Bible study. If you've enjoyed this, would you consider doing that whole like and subscribe and bell thing you're always hearing people talk about? It really helps other people find out about the show. And my heart is for people to fall in love with God's word. Thank you.